Are we recording now? All right. So the essential thrust and purpose of this work is to delineate and critically examine Ma'at, the moral ideal of ancient Egypt or Kemet, using the, the declarations of innocence in the New Kingdom text, the book coming forth by day, and other key ethical texts as the fundamental foci, and foci just means focus, right? As the fundamental foci for analysis and in the process, explore the usefulness of Ma'atan ethical thought as a resource for modern moral discourse and philosophic reflection on critical moral issues. So essentially, he wants to kind of pinpoint and pin down what is this concept of Ma'at, right? Um, within this concept of Ma'at, we're dealing with the notion of morals, right? But he wants to see how we could use the moral foci of Ma'at and apply it to what's going on in our moment in 2021, right? He wants to bring that ancient uh, moral concept into the modern, into our contemporary, into our today. Um, so that, that's what Karenga's desire is with the book, right? So what he wants to, to get accomplished. So what we read was the passage, Ma'at, um, the conceptual idea. So I'm going to start on page five towards the middle of the page in the first full paragraph. Um, so one of the things that, before I kind of get into the reading, that I, I think makes the reading dense, makes the reading confusing, um, makes the reading somewhat opaque, is the citation style, right? So this book is written in APA citation, and what you'll notice is a last name, a bracket, a year, and then comma, and a number, right? So essentially what we're looking at is the last name is the author who Karanga is borrowing this idea from. The brackets with the year lets you know what year the text was produced, comma and page number, oh, sorry, comma and the number. The number signifies the page number that this um, passage was located in, right? So I'll, I'll kind of read through and show you how this plays out because to me, it, it, it takes away from the flow of the argument and it makes the reading very choppy, which I, I'm really not a fan of. But if we're going through towards the middle of that, that opening paragraph, he says, actually, this conceptual elasticity, does anyone not know what elasticity means? So you all know what elasticity is? Okay, can somebody um, provide a definition or just a, a way to think about elasticity as it pertains to the reading, as it pertains to Ma'at? Go ahead, speak, say it out loud, Jenny, you're absolutely right. And then George, you could echo what she hears. Uh, the ability to adapt. You wanna to add to that, George? Oh, I was just gonna say flexibility. Yeah. I, I think, like, um... Okay. Yeah, no, you, you guys are both absolutely right. The, the ability to be flexible, the ability, the ability to be expanding, adaptable, right? So how does this relate to Ma'at? How would you bring these two concepts of elasticity and Ma'at together as it pertains to the reading? No ideas? Um, I think it's trying to say that Mott has a, um, different ways that it can be interpreted. Like I saw in the reading, um, some people define Mott as um, a set of morals and others um, defined it as a god. Absolutely. You're spot on, George. I actually like did some more Google searches because okay. uh, I was hella into like Egyptian gods and goddesses when I was younger. I went through a phase. Uh, so like... I was looking it up and Ma'at is the goddess of justice and harmony. And then when I was like going through it, uh, she is like, she is basically like anything you want her to be as long as it like aligns with that type of like yeah. stuff. Like um, in my thesis, I literally wrote, hold on a second. Uh, Ma'at is basically the goddess who holds up the original court system with better general ethics. And yeah. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I think you're spot on. Um, so how, how he articulates this in the reading, and we're going to kind of get into uh, this uh, notion of arguments, because what we read was a philosophical text. And when you're dealing with philosophy, what becomes important is the argument. And within the argument is also understanding where the counter argument takes place, right? And I'll read and then I'll kind of explain this as we're reading. Um, actually, 
this conceptual elasticity, which at first glance might seem problematic. So he's saying originally that this elasticity that Mott could be attributed to can be viewed as problematic, right? So now we're gonna get into a, a counter argument. On deeper inquiry is one way to know that we're dealing with a counter argument, or they may say, however, that's another indicator of a counter argument. Does everybody know, let me rephrase it. Does anybody not know what I mean when I say a counter argument? All right. So again, however, we'll let you know that a counter argument is gonna follow. Um, in this phrase he uses on deeper inquiry proves, right? Um, it proves promising and when he talks about it being promising, is this the elasticity of Ma'at? Proves promising due to what Morin's, and this we know we have another author, right? Morin's is the last name, bracket 1984 is the year, comma, page 16, calls Ma'at's, and anything in question marks, or sorry, in quotation marks, you know this is what Morin's is saying, right? So these are the words of Morin's. Ma'at's rich treasury of meaning, right? So he's saying that it's not problematic because Morin's asserting that Ma'at has a rich treasury of meaning, right? So that's one of the benefits of that elasticity. Um, for here, one encounters in Ma'at with Kua, another author, the year 1978, page 138, defines as the pluralized nation, which, is a, which allows for and encourages a wide range of thoughts and interpretations. So that just echoes with George and um, Jana was saying, far as it could be, adapted and shifted and used however you so choose, right? But it must align with the concepts of truth, justice, righteousness, harmony, balance, order, reciprocity, and propriety, right? So moving to page um, six, and we're, again, we're starting with the first full paragraph here, um, where it starts off the etymology. Does anyone not know what the term etymology means? Okay, great. Okay, Valeria. So etymology essentially is the origin of the word, right? How you could get the definition of the or tra word tracing back its origins, right? So it says the etymology of ma'at. And if you notice, there's a comma, and then there's like little miniature hieroglyphics or netur netur, right? And what those are and what they signify is how ma'at was depicted on the walls of the hieroglyphics in the, in the metur netur, right? So this would be how ma'at would be translated in the ancient comedic text, okay? He says, um, the etymology of Ma'at suggests an evolution from a physical concept of straightness, evenness, levelness, correctness, as the wedge-shaped glyph suggests. So originally, Ma'at was conceived as a physical characteristic, right? A physical characteristic representing straightness, evenness, levelness. So if you think about what a ruler does, right? A ruler is designed to make sure that you draw a straight line, right? So that physical characteristic could be embodied as ma'at in its original con conception, right? Think about the work of what a leveler does. So if you hang a picture, you get a leveler to make sure that that picture is level. That could be a physical embodiment of how ma'at was um, re represented and as a physical characteristic, right? But then it evolves. And he says that that wedge-shaped hieroglyph is the how they would describe or how they would draw ma'at, right? To a general concept of rightness. So it evolves into a general concept of rightness, including the ontological and ethical sense of truth, justice, righteousness, order. In a word, the rightness of things, right? So just the way that things should be done in the right and appropriate fashion. Um, Uh, let's see, I think I'll skip past that. Yeah, we'll skip past that. We'll move down to page seven um, towards the bottom. And we'll deal with, it's called like, the, he calls it the four domains of Ma'at, right? So he says the, the, the first domain is the universal domain in which Ma'at is the total, the totality of ordered existence and represents things in harmony and in place, right? So from the standpoint of the universal, that's gonna embody the totality of everything within the universe being in order, right? So the way that the stars are placed in the sky, the way that the earth spins on its axis, right? All these things are set in the divine order which could be understood as Ma'at. 
and from a universal domain. The second domain which is provided is the political domain, right? And it says that the political domain in which Ma'at, sorry, the political domain in which Ma'at is justice and in opposition to anything unjust or unjust, right? So what they're saying is the way that politics was structured in a comedic society was on the emphasis of things being done justly, right? So if a law was gonna be put in the books, they're gonna make sure that that law fortifies justice, right? So does anyone know how laws get placed on the books in our society? Anyone familiar with that process? Anybody heard of the term lobbying? Can you kind of, can you guys can kind of um, provide us some insight as to what lobbying does or what it's designed to do? Either Kimberly or um, Jeremy, one of you guys, someone, one, one nod your head, one put a hand up. Yeah, uh, well, kind of from what I remember it, not sure if it's like completely right, but it's when like companies or like certain people want to influence what's going on in politics. So they try to line, they try to like target with some of the politicians. The reason they call it lobbying is because usually when they're walking around in their offices or like around, they try to get them there. And then they'd be like, oh, um, like if you go for this, uh, this law that I'm trying to create, then uh, I forgot something will happen. I don't know. Like they just try to basically they just try to convince the politician to. Um, and, yeah, and, and one of the ways that they may do this um, is they may say, well, we have 2000 signatures who support that law. Um, if you are to pick up this law or this bill, um, that could possibly be 2000 votes for your next campaign or whatever the case may be. Right. So to me, there is ineffective lobbying and there's effective lobbying. And, and I, I got this from the time that I spent as an intern with the California Faculty Association on Cal State LA's campus. Uh, we went up to Sacramento and we lobbied around a law that would prevent tuition increases for the Cal State systems. Right. And when we finally got into the offices, I don't remember um, who it was, who the politician was, but essentially what she said to, to us. What you guys are doing is important, you know, in all intents and purposes, I support the bill you're trying to pass and what you're trying to do. Um, the signatures help, but one thing that you're missing is an envelope and the envelope has money in it, right? And she says, really where lobbying gets, when these bills get pushed through, people do all the same things that you do, but they're also coming with that envelope. And that's gonna make these things get onto a, on the book a lot quicker than just the signature, right? This is what she told me from her mouth. So I, I bring this up to draw a, a juxtaposition between how things are done here and what politics is about, is about in, from a Ma'atan perspective, right? So it's not about if you could put money on the books. It's not about signatures. It's strictly about if it's just or not, or if it's in opposition to injustice, right? So that's how the political order of the Kamek society was, was um, cultivated. The third domain is the social domain. So just think about society when they say social, right? How individuals interact with one another. The social domain in which the focus is on right relations and duty in the context of community, right? So again, this notion of relations, um, being right and righteous with your relations and how you interact with the community. And the fourth domain is the personal domain, which in which following the rules and principles of Ma'at, is to realize concretely the universal order in oneself to live in harmony with the ordered whole. So the fourth domain intersects with the first domain, right? So the, the idea is to master yourself so that way you could interact harmoniously with the universe, right? So you could be in divine alignment with everything else from the social, from the political to the universal, right? But in order to do that, you must first make sure that all of your situations are aligned appropriately, right? You're, act, you're pre uh, performing and living life from a state standpoint of being truthful, being justice, being harmonious, being righteous, right? Being in order. So those are the four domains of my eye. Um, yeah, I'll skip that one too. What we'll do is we'll go to page 10 and we'll start with the first full paragraph here. And it says, the key point of this discussion 
then is that the practice, the practice of Ma'at is conceived and carried out within the worldview which links the divine, the natural, and the social. These three domains are interrelated, interactive, and mutually effective. And that's effective with an A, not with an E. And, it, and a Ma'atan person understands this and acts accordingly as the, historic, as the history of the idea of Ma'at which is presented below demonstrates, right? So he's saying that the, the um, divine, the natural, so when he says the divine, he's talking about God, he's talking about spiritual influence, right? When he talks about natural, he's talking about nature itself. And, he's, and then he's talking about social, again, he's talking about society, right? So this worldview links these three domains. So if you're living a life that's divine, you're gonna treat nature a certain way. You're gonna treat people a certain way. Right. So how in our world we're dealing with global warming, this wouldn't be an issue in, in Ma'atic or Kemetic society because they're going to make sure that they're alignment in alignment with nature. Right. They're going to make sure that they're taking care of the earth. Right. They're going to make sure that they're learning from the earth because that's what Ma'at is instructed, instructing us to do and how it instructing us to perform. But this interconnection, it plays out in real time when it comes to how the comedics perceive the afterlife. Give me one second, I'm gonna pull, up, pull something up and I'm gonna share my screen. Bear with me for a moment. Hmm. All right. Okay, so does everybody see this image here where my mouse is kind of circling around? Yes. Okay, Yeah. so what you have here is Ma'at, right? And you could always know that Ma'at is being embodied because you can see the feathers, right? And what this scene is depicting for those who are like in the Catholic religion, um, which you may understand as like pur pur purgatory, like kind of waiting to see if you're going to heaven or hell, so to speak. Um, this is kind of the same situation. And what's taking place is this individual here is going to state the 42 confessions of Ma'at or the 42 confessions of innocence. You'll notice here there's a scale. On the scale, you have this individual's heart, and then you have a miniature depiction of Ma'at. Typically, it's either something like this or just the feather itself, right? And what happens is, as the individual is stating the 42 confessions of Ma'at, I have not killed, I have not stolen, I have not coveted my neighbor's wife, et cetera, et cetera. His heart is being weighed against this feather. And, as if, he, and if he's able to set, state the 42 confessions uh, truthfully, um, state them wholly, and state them in a way that reflects his life, then the heart will be lighter than the feather and you'll be able to successfully transition to the afterlife or what we may in the Christian and Catholic um, tradition understand as heaven, right? So that's how the divine, the natural and the social intersect in real time for the ancient comedic societies as it relates to the afterlife, right? So if you are not living in divine way, then your heart will not be lighter than that feather. If you're not honoring nature, then your heart will not be um, lighter than that feather. If you're not, um, in positive social relations, then your heart will not be lighter than that feather and you will not be able to transition successfully to the afterlife, right? So this is the way that Ma'a in real time affects the way that the comedics view the relations between social nature and the divine. Um, so I'm gonna put myself on pause. We'll transition into our fishbowl um, again. For your fishbowl, you could use your journal. You could use whatever I discussed in the conversation just now. Uh, you could use what was discussed in your breakout groups. Nothing is off the table. Um, you have one time to pass and you're tasked to do two fishbowls per semester. Um, is there anyone who wants to volunteer? Um, I would like to volunteer. I'm sorry, who said that? Uh, uh, Nicole Mead. Oh, okay, thank you, Nicole. Any other volunteers? I would also like to volunteer. Okay. Um, anyone else? If not, I'll just start calling people randomly. I'd like to volunteer. 
Okay, so Alexander, Janet, have you gone already? Uh, I've spoken like on the last discussion. Um, as a fishbowl or just kind of commentary? Uh, as a fishbowl. Okay. Um, let's do this. Let's put you on pause just to kind of give someone else an opportunity to volunteer if they want to. And if not, we'll have you do your second. Um, is there anyone else who wants to volunteer? Did you get me down? Yeah, I got you, Alexander. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, Jan, if you want to do knock out your second one now, you certainly can. Um, and then you'll be done for the semester, okay? All right, so um, we have Nicole, Liliana, Alexander, and Jana. Um, I'll put myself on pause, and whoever wants to kick it off, it's on you. Oh, I guess I, I guess I'll start. Um, so when I was reading the part two, the confessions part, um, it kind of reminded me of rules like uh, let me elementary classroom you know how they're short and straight to the point um how instead of the things you shouldn't do it's things you can't do based on it because it's wrong and they're really short and straight and you know they all start with a lot of i have not which kind of reminds me of um like a, uh, the lanam laminated poster at the back of the kindergarten classroom goes i will be quiet when someone speaks or i will be respectful uh, somewhere along the lines of that. Who's next? Um, I agree with Nicole. Um, I essentially uh, interpret it as like a guideline for getting in, into the afterlife. And um, well, basically, it's just like, whereas like I compared it to the last reading that we uh, read, and essentially, this one was more of like what you shouldn't do, whereas the other one was more like what you should do to be a good person. And then um, I kind of like compared it to a uh, baptismal promise, like when you're Catholic and then you, um, uh, well, you get your baptism and stuff. Um, also kind of like the 10 commandments and um, like when you renounce your sins and then like judgment day, like in the Christian religion too. Um, yeah, that was pretty much like what I got from it. Um, I agree with that. Liliana, well, I was gonna say that uh, it sounded like it was like a prayer, like they're worshiping. Because well, in religion we well, I'm a Catholic, so in my religion we we do we do prayers and we repeat mostly the same thing. So it sounded like it was just repeating when they were like, "I have not caused, I have not, I have not." It just sounded like they're repeating. So like if they were ashamed of something they have done, so they commit that they didn't do it, so they wouldn't be judged. Under, uh -huh. that's what I got from it. Yeah. Okay, so like I kind of want to jump into this. So like um you know like that thing like, okay, when I was like reading like the uh I did not do like the declarations of innocence, um it kind of reminded me of like the oath that you take when you were like I saw so like I solemnly swear and all that stuff like you put your hand on the bible or like whatever religious text you have there and then you like you make like an oath to yourself it kind of reminds me of that mm -hmm. so um one far as what um nicole said right she said she could kind of remind her of kindergarten in the sense that it's not telling you what you shouldn't do or what not to do, but more so of, a, of agreements of what you have not done, right? And, and I think that's a very um, important part. Also kind of thinking about those who juxtaposed it to the Ten Commandments. So I want to kind of take these two comments and merge them together. So what, how are the Ten Commandments phrased? What's the, the terminology behind the Ten Commandments? How do they sound? You will not do this. You shall not, right? Yeah. It's telling you what not to do. The juxtaposition to the 42 confessions is I have not, right? So why is that distinction become important? And it could be relocated in a temporal analysis and an analysis of time. Why is that distinction important? One of them kind of sounds like you are like 
only speaking for yourself while the other one is kind of like commanding you to not do that. Absolutely. Okay. And I, but let, let's get, get kind of think about time. Think about time. So what's the distinction as it pertains to time? Thou shall not, I have not. What's the tense behind those from a temporal standpoint? One is past and one is present. Right. So Jeremy speaks, like, let us know a little bit more. Why is that? Why do you think that becomes significant? Why is, um, why is I have not being past tense significant, whereas thou shall not being future tense? Um, why is that significant? Why do you think? Um, I think because you have done it, or you've already done it, and you're explaining yourself so that you can go to the heavens or the afterlife where like I shall not means you haven't done it yet and you will do it maybe <laughs> right no you're, you're spot on so think about and this is what she's essentially saying right so if you think about the image that I just shown the individual who's before the scales he already died right he already made his transition so there's no point of commanding him on what to do I'm in the afterlife right like I, I, I live my life I didn't done my deeds so therefore it becomes a past tense claim. I have not killed. And you can look back at my life and see I haven't killed anyone. I have not stolen. You can look back at my life and see I haven't stolen anything, right? So if you're saying these things and the way that your life has was lived does not add up, your heart will be heavier than the, than the, the feather, right? Whereas the, the commandments, excuse me, are telling you what not to do, right? This is before, this could be from your, from birth, it could be from, you know, while you're in life, right? It's giving you commandments. Also, I, Jana mentioned something that made me think about conquest, right? So you could take the Ten Commandments to another society, to another country and institute them, right? But you really can't say the same for the 42 confessions because you could try to institute them, but the way that they're structured is for someone who's already made their transition, right? So you would have to know what you should and should not do before you could effectively state those, right? So to me, the commandments and a commandment within itself is more leading to the notion of the ability to conquest, the ability to force and coerce society, right? So that, that's a distinction also you could be drawn from the um, declarations or the confessions of innocence juxtaposed to a commandment. Yes, um, mission, yeah, missionaries, absolutely. Um, also, the, the holding, the, the accountability, right? So, uh, Esmeralda, can you, can you um, comment a little bit more about the accountability? And are you speaking to the accountability to the 42 confessions or the accountability of the commandments? Esmeralda? Oh, the, to the 42 confessions. Okay. So can you elaborate a little bit more on the accountability piece? Because it's a good point. So pretty much it's like it's saying I have not. So it's like holding you accountable before you even do your actions. So you have to think of the process. You have to think of the action before you do them. So while like um, the commandments are more like they blame you kind of like, like they're judging you beforehand, I feel like. Yeah, um, the, the commandments are, um, I mean, it's just that, it's a command, right? They're commanding you on what you should and what you should not do. Um, whereas the, the confessions are stated for you to be judged, right? Because if you think about, think back to the image, Ma'at is sitting in the position of judgment, right? She's sitting up on her square and she's looking down, judging to see if, as he articulates these confessions, is he stating them truthfully, essentially what it is. And that's the judgment process. Um, but let's do this. Let's shift the conversation a little bit. I'm curious to hear what you guys discussed in your uh, breakout groups as it pertains to questions that you had around the reading. And then we could either, you know, attempt to answer those questions or just, you know, attempt to engage the questions best as, can, as we can. Um, so if anybody wants to explain what was discussed in the breakout group, pref preferably somebody who we haven't heard from today yet. And you can volunteer or I can start calling on people. It's up to y'all.
Um, in our breakout room, we discussed basically that they were just like moral ethic codes that people should have been following throughout their life if they want to make it to like the afterlife, basically. What about any questions that were posed in the group? Uh, the questions that we had were just, um, we were a little confused on the the fathers. We we're confused as to kind of who's who, like when the um, when they were speaking about the rules. Can you can you point me to a page? Uh, yeah, hold on, let me pull it up really quick. Yeah. And if somebody else wants to chime in while she locates the page, you can feel free. Anyone else has any questions or any thoughts, any comments? Um, in my group, we just kind of said how it like reminded us of like religion, like where you're supposed to um, repeat something multiple times, kind of like when you, um, like the rosemary, mm -hmm. like for those of us who are Catholic, that was kind of what we talked about. Yeah, you know, that's something that's definitely uh, um, a reoccurring theme. Everyone's kind of comparing, you know, in the both classes that, that dealt with this text, um, the religious comparison. Um, I put in the chat Ashwa Kwesi. He's a scholar and a researcher who deals a lot with um, this type of theology. And essentially what his argument is, and I think one of his books are titled um, The Comedic Origins of All Major World Religions, right? And um, essentially what he's saying is from Catholicism to Christianity to Buddhism to Islam, they all have their origins back to the comedic lifestyle and the comedic um, spiritual practices, right? And essentially what he's, the narrative that he tells is that when the Greeks and Romans came into Kemet and they conquered Kemet, um, they took all the materials in the library, they took all the information that was written down, um, they held it in their libraries or they burned it, right? And what they were able to excavate, they attempted to interpret and they develop these religions out of that, right? So one example that you find is the story of Haru, Aset, and Asar, right? And that is the um, same story that's being told through the narration of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, or Jesus, Mary, and God, however you want to, you know, situate that, right? Um, Haru would be Jesus, a set would be Mary, and then a Sar would be God or Joseph. And, and the way that the story plays out in comedic texts is exactly the same. Haru had, is crucified. He goes through a three-day resurrection period, and he comes back to life. The, the terminology is the same. The theology is exactly the same. But just like um, the oldest book in the world predates Christianity by at least 2,500 years, right? These texts and these stories predate Christianity even before that. So what Asher Kwesi argues is all Western religions, all monotheistic religions can be traced back to the comedic society. And I think that's why when you read these things, there's that thread of similarity between all these religions and what's being said within these texts. Uh, was it Jamie, were you, were you able to find the location as far as the, um, the, the, the father passage? Yeah, I found it, but I ended up answering my own question. Can you fill us in with the answer? Yeah, so what I thought um, when they were bringing, so it's page six, okay. when they were bringing up the other authors, I thought they were bringing up different gods. So I was confused, but I just realized now that they were just interpreting different meanings of the goddess. Okay, okay. yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, um, to be real sure, I kind, of, I kind of mentioned this earlier in the conversation, Jamie, I can't stand APA citations. It's super <laughs> like, um, I'm, I'm more, um, 
have more of an affinity for Chicago citations where you'll just see like a little number and then yes. it doesn't break up the flow of the reading. So that, that's extremely confusing, even for me. Um, any other questions or comments? I'm really curious to know what was discussed as far as the questions that you guys had. And again, think about the three paradigms of questions that I laid out at the start of the of class, right? Question for a deeper understanding, questions for critique, um, questions that guide research. It doesn't have to just strictly be questions because I did not understand. Any other questions or even thoughts about the reading? I was just gonna make a like little thought. I kind of liked how they mentioned that they if there were many interpretation about on the mat. Um, and it's kind of, again, bringing up religion. It's very different from like what I know, like uh, what is it, Catholicism? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because um, there it's straightforward. You have to like, or kind of straightforward, you know? <laughs> um, like, it's like, you have to do this, you have to do that to like do this. But the but this one, it's kind of, it's different. It's like based on the situation, based like, there's just different things that you have to bring together. It's not just one thing. It kind of is more accepting, maybe, if this is the word. Yeah. Not sure. Yeah, so. that's kind of what I thought about. Uh, and, and I think too, what, I, what I'm hearing in your comment, Kimberly, is it, it leaves room for context, right? Because it's elastic and it's elasticity, yes. context can be applied to how it's being used and how it's being interpreted, which is, is farly different from a lot of our um, religions that are so black and white and uncontextualized, right? Especially from the standpoint of time, because a lot of things that you find in the Old Testament don't really relate to our society today. Whereas the concepts of Ma'at, they're flexible in the sense that you can have them adapted to what's going on now, which is the whole thrust of what Karanga wants, right? How can we use my eye and bring that into our world now? Other questions, other comments, other concerns? Um, I found it interesting. I feel like, was my aunt given a gender of a woman? Yes, absolutely. So I found it interesting how they mentioned um, life giving force. Because like in the previous reading, we also talked about how women were portrayed as um, people, just um, people that give birth and like continue generations, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, and, and I think those, those are one of these, um, if I'm, we're going back to the, the paradigms of questioning, right? I, I would situate Esmeralda's question almost in the question of critique, right? So what I'm hearing in the question um, if I could do a contrast from last week's reading to this week's reading, um, we talked about the objectification of women uh, and then being objectified for just repro their reproductive abilities, right? Whereas this text is making the woman really as the all-seeing, all-knowing, right? It's the goddess that drives the moral fiber of the society, right? So what that question kind of does it brings into focus the tension between the two readings, right? So how can women be a goddess in one reading and then just used for um, reproductive purposes in another, right? So there's a tension at play there. And that's what I mean when I say a question for critique. Does, does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. Um, go ahead, Kimberly. I was just gonna say, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, let me let me ask you guys this from the standpoint of my pedagogy, right? From for how I go about teaching you guys. Um, one of the things that I found coming out of uh, my master's at Cal State LA going into my PhD program, um, I struggled with reading these type of texts. And, and one of the reasons being is things like the citations. Um, so do you find it helpful how, and that's the reason why I kind of went about approaching the reading in the fashion that I did, explaining the citation formats, explaining how philosophical texts are being read, explaining the difference between a counter argument and an argument. Um, let me know if that's redundant, if that's useful, am I wasting my time? Because I, I wanna be at the level of your learning styles, right? I, I, and I know there's a variety of different um, class ranks here. We have freshmen in the class, we have sophomores, we have juniors, but I wanna be you know, useful for all modes of learning. So again, my giving you a method to reading these type of texts, do you find that redundant, distracting, useful? Um, I'm, I'm curious to know. Useful? Yeah, I like it because it, um, it conceptualizes a lot of things and it makes it easier to remember what we're talking about. Okay. Um, 
And another thing too, because like this is gonna, like these type of readings will engage them in the future as well. So hopefully we could kind of use this text and build on what worked in the sense of how you understood what you're reading as you go into the next um, text. One thing a student mentioned in group A that I thought was a really good point was she likened the elasticity of Ma'at and its conceptualization to poetry, right? Whereas poetry has a variety of meanings. Um, you know, excuse me, Jeremy could read one poem and have an interpretation, and then um, George could read the same poem and have a vastly different interpretation, right? And you can kind of see that come into play with Ma'at. The reason I bring that up is because as we go into next week's reading, we're dealing exactly with that, a poetic, right? And a poetic is, um, think if you were to think about um, an essay and a poem having a baby, that would be a poetic, right? It's like the, the ability to take this essay, this essay framework and be um, flexible, elastic, uh, be elastic with the words that you use, right? So it gives you a little bit more leeway in the way that you go about posing an argument. Um, it allows for a lot more interpretation it allows for a lot more metaphors, a lot more similes and things of that nature. So just keep that in mind as you're doing next week's reading, right? Don't try to um, constrain how you're interpreting, how you're interpreting what you're reading, right? Just let, let your mind go. You know, chances are you're, you're on the right track. Um, are there any other questions, comments, concerns about this reading, readings from last week, anything at all? Any observations? I just generally find it very interesting. Um, well, I, I find it, I, I find the teachings of Maud and last week's reading uh, Ptahhotep, I find it very interesting how our education system and how the history I was taught um, growing up is very Eurocentric. And it's kind of a shame because learning this now and seeing the origins of the the many religions that we have now, I think that would have been very useful growing up. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, does everybody understand what George means when he says Eurocentric? Yeah, okay. So it's it's around Europeans and white people and the white view of things, making it a one side story where their minorities' voices cannot be heard. Right, absolutely. So um, I would say my approach and um, Pan-African studies approach, they take more of an Afrocentric approach, right? So we're gonna place the experiences of African people at the center of the educational experience. But I think the, the difference or the bifurcation between Afrocentrism and Eurocentrism is we don't leave in the space of Afrocentrism, we don't leave the other communities on the margins, right? Um, part of Afrocentrism is recognizing that the Americas, right, are indigenous land. And that's not a, in, in conflict with Afrocentric thought to recognize that, right? Um, we look at the connections and the, the cultural um, blends between indigenous culture and African culture. Um, one of the books that I think we're reading in this semester um, is, oh, no, we're not reading this. There's a really good book called They Came Before Columbus by Ivan Van Sertima. And with that, essentially talks about how there was an African presence in the Americas um, at least 2,000 years before Christopher Columbus arriving to what he thinks were the Americas, right? And that African presence, it blended and meshed with the indigenous presence here and produced cultures. And one of those cultures that's being, that was produced was the Olmec cultures, where you find the very large Olmec heads in Central America, right? So this is an um, a Afrocentric view of the discovery, not, and I'm not even gonna call it a discovery because you can't discover something that was already there, right? But it was this Afro Afrocentric view of the cultural um, creolization of the Americas, right? But again, it's important because it does not leave the other cultures outside of African culture to the margin like Eurocentrism does, right? Um, the reading for this week, yes, it, um, the reading for this week was Ma'at not the comedic proverb. Um, so let me ask you guys this question. How, how, how do you feel about the flow of the class, the breakout rooms, the fishbowl class conversation? Is that working for you guys? Um, is it distracting for you guys? How do you feel about it? And, and be honest because I'm open to changing it and that's why I asked. 
okay you like it like it. this is really good okay. i like it a lot okay cool cool so we'll continue down that path um i just like to check in man because um again the part of the not even part a major component of my pedagogy is placing you guys at the center of the experience so um there's a lot of paradigms that are teacher or instructor focused or teacher centered for me i, I flip that paragraph dime and i make it student focused so when I ask you this, I'm not just asking for hyperbole. I'm asking for your input so I could change what's not working. Um, I'm going to pull up our Google Classroom site and I'll let you guys know what our next readings are. Give me one second. Okay, so for next week, our readings will be Glissant, Poetics of Relation. So again, remember this is an actual poetic, not quite a poem, not quite an essay, but the blending of the two. And the poetic is called The Open Boat. It's not long, but try to take some time with it because again, the interpretation is, is vast and it, um, it could be interpreted in a variety of fashions. And so if we're thinking about just the genealogy of the course, right? Um, we start off with the question of who African people are. We jumped into the question of what was their moral guidepost, right? Um, so going forward in this next reading, we'll be actually leaving or starting the process of leaving the African continent, continent. Um, hence the open boat, right? And as we go into that process, we'll start to, start to get into um, enslavement, revolts, um, resistance against marginalization and oppression and things like that. And that will kind of bring us, start the process of bringing us into more contemporary conversations. Um, is there any questions about anything before we let out? Does everybody know what the reading is for next week? So again, the reading is glissant. Poetics of Relation, the poetic is was titled The Open Boat. I'm gonna try to send out the readings tomorrow. It's just for me, Fridays are so uh, really crazy because I have like a three hour seminar and a lot of reading and prep work. So sometimes my mind when I got a seminar is just not there. So if I remember, I will send out an email with the readings, but if not, they're available on the Google Classroom site for you guys to uh, access. If there are any questions, comments, concerns, don't feel free, feel free to email me, text me, whatever it works best for you. Other than that, be safe, be healthy, get some sun, get some water, get some exercise. Please wear your mask. Um, they're saying now it's best to double up on the mask. Other than that, you guys be well, and I will see you next week. Peace. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Nice day, Professor. Yeah, thank you. you guys too. You guys too.